It's a great day for a great episode. And my guest today is here to take your personal training business to new heights. There is a plethora of information to help sharpen your sales tools when it comes to selling personal training. Stay tuned for another educational episode from the Fitness Business Podcast. Want to be in the know? Follow the Fitness Business Podcast on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn for all of the latest updates on guests, episodes, and hosts. Also, head to iTunes, leave us a review, tell us about your favorite guest or episode. Welcome back to the Fitness Business Podcast. I'm your host, Dory Nugent, and listen up, personal trainers. I was able to get industry expert Anthony Amen here to help you sharpen your skills on selling personal training. He answers the question about the importance of knowing how to sell. He talks about why role playing is important, and he also delivers the steps to take before you start selling. After today's episode, Anthony will have you turning yourself into a selling machine. Now, I'll get the episode started in less than two minutes. First, a few words from our amazing sponsor, MyZone. MyZone has pioneered unique wearables with talking point technology that makes the difference. Reach more members of your community and keep them engaged for longer through motivation and gamification wherever they choose to work out. In the gym, at home, or outdoors, we're stronger together. Get in the zone at myzone.org. MyZone, thank you so much for everything you do for the Fitness Business Podcast. At BP Family, check out www.myzone.org. Get your pen ready now for MyZone's Fitbizpiration. Anthony, what are your top three takeaways from today's episode? One, role-playing, do it. <laughs> Two, A or B. Keep things to A or B options, the less, the better. Three, make a bad joke before you start any kind of sales process. Coming next week to the podcast, visionary and founder of Keatley Enterprises, Tim Keatley. Tim's last two episodes here on the podcast have been a complete success Therefore, we decided to bring him back for another appearance. With Tim's extensive resume in the industry, he shares his lessons he learned along his lifetime journey in the fitness industry. He's so relatable and he speaks from the heart. So you're not going to want to miss his episode. Professional facilitation with a group of non-competing owners to stay ahead of the industry curve is the USP of Rex Roundtables. To find your local roundtable, go to rexroundtables.com. That's rexroundtables.com. It's time to transition into this week's interview with Anthony Amen. Welcome Fitness Business Podcast family to today's episode. I have Anthony Amen with me. Anthony is the owner and also the visionary behind Redefine Fitness. Anthony, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me on. I'm really excited. And like I told Dory pre-show, this is the first fitness business podcast I ever listened to when I started my company. I know. We're so honored. Thank you so much. We love hearing that from all of our fitness business podcast family. Now, listen, you have a really unique story. I love the fact that you had an interesting relationship with fitness when you first started. You didn't kind of come out of the gates running uh, from what I read, it sounds like you had an injury uh, during your college days that kind of changed your path and kind of led you into fitness, which ultimately re created redefined fitness. Yeah, I mean, you kind of go off my questions from the last week. You know, it's I was wanted to be a meteorologist. That's what I wanted to be my entire life, and I really went to school uh, to really start that journey. And when I was 20 years old, I was playing a sport no one heard of called broomball, unless you're from Canada, and you definitely know what it is. But <laughs> it's like hockey for those that don't know. And I just misstepped during one of the games, and I fell backwards, and I slammed the back of my head against ice. I thank God I was wearing a helmet, but I 
herniated every single disc in my neck, ended up with a concussion and ended up suffering from tension migraines for about a year. So it was pretty bad injury and all, a bunch of doctors wrote me off. I could have frozen shoulder. They said, you'll never be able to lift your arm above your head again. You won't be able to move your neck. Yeah, about once a week, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed because the tension migraines, I wouldn't be able to look at light around me. And they just said, we can't help you. I had a doctor, the last one I went to, told me he's a physician, not a magician to get out of his office. And that's a true story. And I was just felt defeated. So I was like, you know what? I can't live like this. I'm 20 years old. I got my whole life ahead of me. So I just started going to the gym and figuring out through a lot of trial and error about what works, what doesn't work how to make myself feel better, how to move my neck a little more. And I wouldn't say that my neck is cured. Obviously, it's still severely damaged, but I haven't had a migraine since I was 21 years old and I'm 33. And I can move my neck fully, I can move my shoulders fully. And I figured out how to keep the pain and everything at bay. So I wanted to show that passion to others because it's like, if I can do it coming from a kid who was the most unathletic person in the world everybody else can too. So that's how the company started. Yeah, I love that story. And I'm glad you touched based upon it because I just like the fact that I laughed when I read that you referred to yourself as making very poor dietary choices <laughs> when you were younger. And I think, you know what, a lot of us can relate to that. So no, I mean, Taco Bell was like an every other day occurrence. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Taco Bell isn't healthy? <laughs> yes, apparently not. <laughs> well, besides your story being really interesting, I also think it's a really your gym, Redefined Fitness, your boutique studio. You run a really interesting concept. And I thought that was interesting as well as your personal trainers and your your primary, just to, to put it out there, your primary focus is personal training, yeah. Redefined Fitness. But you run it a little differently. You're you told me that your personal trainers are salaried, that that's their full time job. Could you explain to our fitness business podcast family just so they kind of understand w what your model looks like? Yeah. So a lot of us started off as employees, and that was me. I wanted to work at every gym to learn how gyms operated. And then when I started my company, I went to the same route every other gym did pay the trainers per session rates. The turnover was unbelievable. And I, I really sat back and thought like, you know, I can't, people can't live like that. So I wanted to give back to my trainers and I wanted to keep them with me. And I wanted to change the fitness industry because people took us as a joke. So I said, you know what, I'm going to make these salary positions. And I started that this year, actually, in January 1st was the first day I offered up salaries. They work off of a tiered schedule. So they start at $40,000 a year, make up to 60 based upon certain different parameters. They get 401ks. They get benefits through AFLAC. Um, we're working on adding medical insurance as well. They get paid time off. Same thing, they work any other job. So now they can go home to people and say, I have a career. I do want to mention one little important thing, Dory, and I really want people to reach out to me about this. Over the course of five years, I was trying to get something established for the state of New York for a licensure for trainers. So it's not based upon certifications anymore. Because as we all know, half the certifications are good, half of them are BS. So I got it approved finally to the Department of Labor. So for the first time ever, there's an apprenticeship program approved through New York State that gives the gym an opportunity to hire somebody full time, you pay them a salary. Then the school through grants will set up a college education for them so they can get free college courses for personal training. And they work two years through this apprenticeship program. And then when they graduate as a journeyman, they have a license to the state of New York. Our, my two trainers are going to be the first two ever to go through this. And this program's open up to everybody. And we're looking to push it out multi-state. So if you're interested, please reach out. Let's change this industry forever. I love it. Thank you for sharing that, Anthony. At Re Redefined Fitness, you guys really focus on sales. And that's why we yeah. brought on today because you're going to really talk about trying to help personal trainers with sales. Listen, we all know that personal training and sales doesn't always ne necessarily mesh really well. It's something that most personal trainers have to work on. So I just want you to kind of talk about why you, Anthony, feel that it's important for these personal trainers to know how to sell. Easy. 
we all get in this industry to help others, period. How can you help others if you don't have them work with you? Think about that. If I'm, my intention is to help out 10, 20, 30, 40 people, whatever it is in their lives, and I know they could benefit from this, if I can't sign them up, what's the point? How many of your trainers that you hired when they first came to you admitted that sales wasn't their strong point? Every single one. <laughs> <laughs> because we all know trainers get into this industry because they love helping other people. They love working with people, their relationship, all the personal relationship base. And they get intimidated because they're like, oh, it's a lot of money. Like we don't sell basic gym memberships. So we're not selling 20, 30, $40 a month memberships. Our average ticket price is 500 up to $1,400 a month that people are signing up for. So you have to know what you're talking about and know how to approach that in order to sell something like that. And I personally believe personal training is what's going to help the most amount of people because how many people sign up for a gym and never go? Right. Right. Well, before we get into you talking about the important steps to take before you start selling, I just kind of want to get the monkey out of the room in the sense that I know just being in the fitness industry for so long that personal trainers get nervous about selling because they think they're being pushy. And, you know, pushy often, you know, kind of is associated with sales, you know, a pushy salesman. So, how do you deter? your trainers from feeling as if they're being pushy to just trying to sell to get people signed up? Great question. It's all about intention. That's what it comes down to. And I make this very, very clear to the entirety of my staff. Don't sell something you don't think is going to benefit somebody. We get in this industry to help others. So sell something that you think is honestly going to sell them. Like we have half an hour, 45 an hour long sessions. I'm not going to sell someone an hour session just to get the most bang for my buck. If I personally believe the benefit from a half an hour, I'm putting them in half an hour. So it's B, it's your attention behind it. And people can read rooms. Our nonverbal communication, we suck at hiding. So if you can show that you're genuinely there to help that person, you're going to get the sale. That's that's the easiest way to think about it. Yeah, we used to call commission breath. We used to say that people can smell commission breath a mile away. And it's the same exact thing. It's just rephrased a different way. It's like you trying to sell something that they really don't need. There's no intention. It's just, yeah. I want your money and that's it. So, okay. All right. Now let's get to the important steps to take before you start selling. I think our trainers will gain some great knowledge from what you have to say here. Yeah. First, you need to know the difference, which I found a lot of people don't know between sales and marketing. Marketing is bringing people into your doors, showing the interest of your company, working on brand awareness. Sales is once point of contact is made. Whether it's through a lead online or whether it's in person, that's what when we start the sales process. So first and foremost, the absolute first step is how your gym looks and present itself. And this is way before someone ever makes contact with you. If I'm coming to spend $10 a month, I'm not expecting much from the gym. I'm expecting a $10 a month gym. If I'm coming in for a $500 a month gym, I need to have everything set up where people walk into that expecting it to be, oh, this is worth $500 a month. Look at the difference between we're walking into a Walmart as opposed to walking into like a Gucci store. It's all about presentation and how everything looks. I am obsessive over cleaning. Our gym needs to be able to eat off the floor. So when a customer walks in, they're making an opinion. I think it's like three seconds. Someone's going to make an opinion of a place. So everything from pulling up to the, the gym, to opening the door inside, to what they see with your staff all around and what is, what is everyone doing, they're making that judgment before they even tell you what their name is. All right. So you have presentation. You feel like that's one of the steps before. What's the next step? Next step is basically everything drops. When someone walks into your door or you're making con initial contact with somebody, everything is relying on that person. Whatever the, a trainer or anybody else is doing, the world ends. They stop. And they're going to address the needs to that person. The last thing 
that anyone wants to see walking into the gym is someone with their phone looking down. Oh, hey, how's it going? Hold on, let me finish this task. No, you get up, you go introduce yourself to that person and you make basic contact about who they are as an individual and get to know them and don't worry about anything else. Everything else can wait. Right now, it's you just stay up for that person because it takes a lot to walk into a gym. Like, especially someone coming directly in. Think about this, how nervous most people are you're in stepping foot because they know they're going to be approached. And they're like, I really don't want to be here. So it's your job to make that person as comfortable as possible. And I'm happy just to go right into the steps if you'd like, Dory. Yeah, go ahead. Take it away. You're doing a great job. <laughs> All right. So next step after you make initial contact with that person, it's going into a tour. Now, a lot of gym owners, or personal trainers, this is where they kind of lose the client. I used to work at a big box gym and I can't tell you that I would blow away their sales numbers and everyone else wouldn't be able to get it because literally they would do a tour and go, that's a treadmill, that's a bike, that's where we do weights. Like, no sh like people have eyes. <laughs> like that's how you don't, you never want to do tours that way. Tours should be about getting to know somebody. I always tell my trainers, it's rapport, rapport, rapport. And people want to talk to you, want to work with you if they feel like they're a part of your team. Now, what does that mean? Humans are very clammy. A great way to think about this is sports. So if I'm a Jet fan, right, I'm going to go out of my way to talk to more Jet fans. I'm going to be like, hey, what's up? It's so much easier to talk to them as opposed to someone who's a Patriots fan. I'm just going to be like, man. So it doesn't matter who an individual is, what walks into your door. It's your job as that person giving that tour to spend that time figuring out something you have in common with that person and then working inside of that because that's going to make you, they're going to be like, oh my God, they're so likable. Oh my God, they have we have this in common. I need to come with them. And trust me, it doesn't matter if you're 20, touring an 80-year-old, you're going to find something in common with somebody. We all have that, even if you have to sit there and dig for it. So as you're walking around, you're, that's your goal. And I'm going to backtrack, actually, because I missed an important step. But before, when someone walks in, it's not, hey, do you want to go on a tour? You never want to ask someone to go on a tour. It's, hey, follow me. And you just start walking, and people are going to be like, and just start following you. Because they're nervous to go on the gym floor. So then you're getting to know them. If you have staff on the floor, this is a great time to introduce them to staff. Say, hey, this is our trainer, Ellie. Hey, this is our client, Jeff. And introduce them to make them feel comfortable, to really feel part of that family as you're getting to know them. Obviously, you ask your basic questions about what brings them in, what are they looking to accomplish? This is how you can help them. And then from there, we don't sign people up on the spot. Uh, you can, if you're a, like a base selling basic gym memberships, that's the next time to go right into that sale of that. But like I said, high ticket items. So when someone walks into our store, we are going to book them a fitness assessment. That's our hour free consultation where we're gonna really sit down, work with that person on the floor. So we walk up to the front desk and this is the most important thing when you're booking someone and I need to stress this so much right here. We have something very specific when we're booking consultations after we ask if they would like one and they say yes, it's called the 48 hour rule. People will lose interest after 48 hours, the interest is going to drop off drastically. Plus, if I book something a week out, I'm going to forget about it. Life's going to come up, but it's not that important. So if someone's coming in, let's say on a Friday, my next question is, are you free Saturday or Sunday? A, B. Okay, I'm free Saturday. Morning or evening? Morning. And then even if your schedule's completely empty, the last thing you want to say is, I'm completely empty. What time do you want to come in today? <laughs> it's no, it's I have a 10 or an 11. Which one works better for you? And have them pick that way and set it up. Trust me, people make these times work on their schedules. We've never had an issue with it. But you're showing a couple of things in this. One, you're showing you're busy. Do you want to go to the restaurant that has a line out the door? Or do you want to go to the restaurant that's completely empty because you can get a table right away? Where are you going to go? We're going uh, to we're going to the line. Oh yeah, why is everyone over there? What's going on over there? I want to go. So you are hopping over to that busy restaurant the same way I'm giving you very specific times of that. Like what the little windows were open to get you in 
the door. We have someone book an assessment and then obviously they will leave and they're going to come back that day for the assessment. But that's a good basis of what happens with the walk-in. Same thing with the TI, which is a telephone inquiry. If someone's calling the gym, it's still the same process. Obviously not touring, but you're getting to know them. You're booking a fitness assessment within 48 hours. You're still working inside that time frame. And really diving into the importance of what that consultation is, how you're going to do movement assessments, and get to know that person and plan on an hour, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a good summary of just walk-ins itself, of how things need to really be function polished and clean. And Dory, I know you can agree with me on this. How important is role playing? Role playing is so important, yet none of us like it. I've yet to find somebody that loves role playing. <laughs> but it's oh, you love it. Okay, there. We oh, go. love it. Well, that's good because you know I wanted to talk to you about role playing just because the in my opinion, the number one thing that role playing helps with is objections because we get objections all the time when we're trying to sell. It's just trying to work through them. So how do you get your trainers to role play and how, and what does that look like? Yeah, we weekly role play. It doesn't matter. New, old, your real role play. And I, if I always preface the point, if you can do it with your coworkers where it's the most awkward, think about how easy it's going to be with a client where it's a lot less awkward, it's easy to talk to them. Yeah. So learn the hard way and really dive into that hard process. And we do it during staff meetings. Maybe this is wrong, but I think it's important. I'll roll a dice, let's say, and say, okay, Alex, you're going to be the client. Ali, you're going to be the trainer. Let's go. Everyone's watching. And then 20 of us are watching them go through the role playing. And then we're going back into the staff meeting and critiquing it. What went wrong? What went right? What can be changed? What's your tone of voice like? Are you making guy contact with them? How close are you to them? All those things are being addressed at that point. I'm giving the staff the opportunity to chime in and give suggestions and changes and all that stuff. And it does, it does work on bonding too. So uh, role playing, I can't stress enough. If you're not doing role playing, you're already falling behind. I, I listen, I agree. And then, you know, all jokes aside about role playing, I think it is the number one way to learn to get better at speaking to people in general, because it does, it just gives you a chance to get, learn your mind to get quick, you know, get quicker in your mind when people object, instead of just being like, if they say no, you're like, oh, okay, thank you. You know, and you walk away, it, it forces you to kind of keep peeling the layers of the onion away that because the client just might have their guard up. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more on that. And I think I would like to jump into what an assessment looks like because that's going to end the actual close for us, signing somebody up. So I'm not going to go through and bore everybody with our exact things we talk about. We're going to really shorten this because it's an hour and I don't want to waste your time here. So the first step is we get someone in the office. It's 15 minutes of getting to know somebody. I'm going to skip all of the figuring out health history, medical history, age, weight, all that stuff. We do all that. That's not an issue. I'm going to get to a, a couple of highlights that I know you're not doing. And I'm going to make sure you add this right away. The first one is find out the person's occupation. Dory, why is that important for selling? Occupation, we're, as a time I ask a trainer why it's important, they say, well, they're sitting all day. I'm like, yeah, great. You know that for your team. But why is it important for the sale? So people get intimidated very, very quickly. Uh, you have to make a few assumptions here. So if you come in and you say you're a doctor or you come in and you say you're a janitor at the school, there's nothing wrong with either of those two answers, but it is going to determine how I am starting my sales process at the end. The last thing you want to do is make somebody nervous and give them anxiety about pricing, right? We all know as trainers that Something is better than nothing. So I need to pin things where somebody can afford it so they can at least get something out of it and see results and not scare them away to get nothing by giving them a high ticket item I know they can't afford. So I'm making an assumption of how much somebody makes. So I'm going to the cell. I know they'll be comfortable with those numbers. You never want to go to someone that does a $15, $16 an hour job and say, hey, you know, I think you need the $1,500 a month membership. How long are they really going to last doing that? First of all, if you get the sale, 
And the second side of it is they're going to run out the door and be like, oh my God, that gym's so expensive. Because they can't, they just flat out can't afford it. And I'd rather them, like I said, get something out of it. So be in their price range and make sure you're always asking what they do for a living. Good advice. I like that. That's that's great. All right. What else about the assessment? Yeah. So we figuring out that we're going on the floor. We're doing a quantitative assessment as opposed to a qualitative assessment. So all that means is fancy words. We're giving a score at the end as opposed to this is what you need to work on, which is wise. After we get a score of running through movement patterns, we're sitting down going into the closing. Now, this is these steps everyone needs to understand right here. The person is coming off the floor, they're going back into the office, and they're already nervous. So a couple of things need to happen. The first thing is when you both get into the office, if you're sitting behind a desk, they're not going to get the sale. That's step one. You never want to put a desk between you and a person. They get intimidated and think it's a teacher talking to a student scenario or something like that, it's a sense of authority. You don't want that sense of authority in a gym. So you want to be up next to them. If you have a couch, I have two chairs that kind of face towards each other with nothing in the middle. So think about that where you are. It's like I said, nonverbal communication is very, it's just as important as verbal. Step one. Step two, when the person sits down, make a bad joke. I don't care what it is. I, the first thing I go is like, well, the gym's going to cost you about a million dollars a month. I only take cash on Mondays and just leave it behind the desk for me, please, um, when you leave. And the person looks at me and then just goes, and then relaxes. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that anxiety of walking into a room, just dissipate. Because it's a lot easier to talk to somebody when they're not all worked up in their head than it is somebody who's super nervous about being there, like working with a call salesman. You just hate yourself when you leave. You don't want buyer's remorse. After you do that, then you go into what you saw on the floor, what needs to be approved on, and then your recommendations of what to do. I, I know you do this, Dory, and I know a lot of gym owners still don't do this, and how many times they heard this? Ask for the sale. Never, ever, ever assume somebody is going to sign up. Use your words and ask. So do you want to sign up for personal training? Would you like to see what our programs look like? Uh, things like that, ask. And then don't say a word. You don't follow up if the person stops and pauses for a minute. You're just going to make them more nervous. He who talks first loses is a great little scenario when it comes to sales. You want to be the quiet person in the room right there. The person says, yes, then we're going back to something I mentioned earlier about booking assessments, A, B. So I go, we have, based upon your assessment, I think you could either use 45 minutes or an hour. Which one do you think would be better for you? 45 minutes, great. I think so too, I think 45 minutes would be great. Based upon what you told me about how you're working out on your own, you're going for walks, it seems like you got your diet under control, I would recommend you work with a trainer two or three times a week. Which one would you like to do? Two times a week. Great. Let's get you signed up. Get the right to the paperwork. Get it going. Get it moving and go from there. Couple of takeaways, A or B options. I'm not throwing a sheet at them. Be like, here's our 600,000 prices and figure it out. It's all right there laid out. Nice and easy. And then also key takeaway from this, I know a lot of gym owners refuse to do this because they're some reason afraid of this. I put all of my pricing on my website. You don't believe me, go check it out. It's redefined-fitness.com, personal training pricing. Every single option we have with the price of that option is on there because the last thing anyone wants to do is relate you to a big company that I'm not going to mention, but we're all remembering who that is who's going to sit there, harass you, line that today's a special day because it a raindrop today, so everything's on sale. You have to sign up right now. Like, like no, these, these are the prices. Like, you'll never get people haggling with you ever again. I haven't had someone haggle in years because that's, here's the pricing. You get the same thing as everybody else. Mm -hmm. 
Keep it equal. I love that. Well, so such great advice today, Anthony. Thank you so much. We, You and I both understand clearly how important it is for personal trainers to be good salesmen, to understand the sales process. And I think you delivered a lot of great advice today. I appreciate it. I just hope that people take the advice, implement it. And really like my goal, I own a gym, but there's no such thing as gym competitors. My competitor is the obesity crisis. So if we can fix that, I'm happy. And if a gym owner could take away from this and get more people in the gym, get them working out, it's a good day for everybody. I love a good sales episode. Thank you, Anthony, for all of your great advice. Anthony's contact information will be on the show notes page, just in case you have any follow-up questions. Today's show notes can be found at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. And if you haven't already signed up for the show notes, hit that subscribe button. That will take away one extra step of Googling the show notes each and every week. (laughs) subscribe to the show notes also at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Up next, I'll introduce you to next week's guest, Tim Keatley. G'day, it's JT here. And I was talking to Blair McKaney, the CEO of one of our sponsors, MX Metrics, the other day. And I gave him a hard time about his company's tagline, defeating mediocrity. By definition, that means he's excluding the majority of the market. But Blair just wouldn't budge. He only wants to work with operators who want to punch mediocrity in the face. Really smash it. So I've talked to a few of his customers, like Joe Shirelli from Gainesville Health and Fitness, and yeah, it's for real. While Joe is a nice guy, he isn't satisfied with mediocrity either. He's crushing it as well. So I'm still dubious about selling only to operators who want to defeat mediocrity. But if this resonates with you, I reckon you should check them out. Go to mxmetrics.com. But remember, only if you're interested in smashing mediocrity. Quick Fire 5, sponsored by Hapana. Please welcome Fitness Business Podcast alum, Tim Keatley, to the Quick Fire 5. Quick Fire 5 is all about getting to know our upcoming guest. So I'd like to introduce Tim Keatley to the Quick Fire 5. Hey, Tim. Hey, how are you? All righty. Listen, you're coming to the show next week. Woohoo! Oh, I know. I've already booked my own ticket. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, before you come to the show next week, we're just going to get to know you and find out some fun facts. The first fun fact is I want to know what your top guilty pleasure is. I've got four. Curry. I love curry. It doesn't matter where I am in the world. Two, comedy clubs. Take me to a comedy club any moment of any day. I love it, to being able to laugh at herself. Three is probably my favorite. Coming up with cheeky surprises for my wife when she doesn't expect them so that she laughs. And last but not least, I will admit this, Shimei Blue Beer. It is the greatest beer in the world. (laughs) All right, everybody's going to be out looking for that right now. They're probably Googling that beer. So awesome. I love it. All right, what's a habit or action you do that helps you to be productive? Uh, It's actually the same ones I mentioned back on my previous ones, which quite simply is I have a daily mantra of five goals and three specific things about being physically, mentally and spiritually well. And I speak them to myself as a mantra, uh, either with my coffee in the morning before I listen to anything else or at the end of a workout and a post-workout. Maybe I'll speak them um, either in prayer or just to myself. Okay, very nice. Now, I'm sure the coffee is going to... It is, by the way. And one of those, just to prove it, was to build, lead, and inspire the world's proudest fitness service business. And I believe over time I've been able to do that. So having a daily mantra works. All right. All right. We'll take that. That's a good one. All right. Now, listen, you mentioned coffee. I'm sure that kind of calms you down, right? (laughs) Oh, perfectly. Yeah, give me five minutes. All right. What do you want to add to that? What's something that calms you down? Travel. I love travel. You know, for for all the years I've been doing what I've been doing, I've really been a paid tourist in many cases. So that's been fantastic. Pickleball with my wife calms me down. It might not calm her down because she loves to kapow the ball as hard as she can to me. Time with the fur families. I love the fur babies. And sometimes golf will calm me down, but sometimes it might not when I'm not playing so well. 
<laughs> yeah, that's always a double-edged sword. That's for yes. sure. Yeah. All right. I'll take one book recommendation for our FBP family. What are you reading these days? Oh, that's really tough. I've got four. Can I be really fast? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Leadership. Servant Leadership. James Autry. Reread it. For Business. Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Amazing for how to scale a business. Culture and Performance. Old one, goody, but stands the test of time. Fish with Stephen London, where you serious business, where you don't take yourself serious. And last but not least, I've said this, it's a book that changed my life. You will see it when you believe it by Wayne Dyer. I read it three times now since the 1990s. Oh, there's some good ones on there. There, There's actually maybe two there that I don't think we've ever had. So thank you for those contributions. We always put a list together every year and push it out to all of our FBP family. So there, there'll be some great additions. All right, I'm going to give you the mic for 30 seconds to welcome everybody and invite everybody to your show next week. Take it away. Okay, well, one of the questions is, why would you bother coming to listen? I'll put it this way. The only regret in life is not wishing you hadn't done something, but wishing you had. And maybe by coming on the show and learning from all of my 30 years of many, many failures, mistakes, and some successes along the way, I might in turn allow you to maybe avoid some of those failures for yourself, maybe allow you to challenge and get through your challenges at a far faster rate. And more importantly than that, allow you to identify the right opportunities so you don't waste time doing other things. If we can do that, I will also share with you, there's only one thing we have to do to be successful in this business, and that is coming in the show. If Tim's episode is anything like his last two, you won't want to miss. So set that calendar reminder and meet me back here next week. Same time? (laughs) What do you say? All right, here we go. You know I'm always here to make your life easier, so subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast player or even better, let us do the work for you and we'll send you the show. Subscribe at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. We couldn't have a show without these amazing folks. So I want to say thank you to our founding partner, Active Management, our partners, Instructor Warrior Academy, MyZone, as well as Hapana. I'd also like to thank our advertisers, Rex Roundtables and MX Metrics. We believe what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but woven into the lives of others. Yeah.